All right. And so like I was mentioning about um, just a second ago, is that we're going to kind of go through a little bit of an alternative to like um, using a server. So like, you know, ideally you'd want to spin up your own server and everything like that and, and maybe distribute system. You have more control over it and all these things. And this is an alternative to basically running some code um, outside, of, like instead of spinning up your own server and running it. Um, the reason why you want to do that versus using your own laptop or your own computer is that your computer and laptop is just restricted in like what kind of power it has. And for specifically about machine learning, a lot of machine learning packages and a lot of algorithms are optimized when using um, parallel processing, which I know we haven't talked about in section 40, but um, uh, from section 40, you talk about like parallelization and stuff like this. And one big thing about this is that it means that you can run things a lot faster. And it turns out um, right now, well, we have a couple tools now. Um, one big kind of like really good thing for like pro parallel processing is something called a GPU, which is called a graphical processing unit. And if you're kind of familiar with computers, but you're not knowing GPUs, a GPU might be compared to like a CPU. A CPU is a, a computational processing unit. And that's kind of like the brains of your computer. So a GPU can't do the same thing as like a CPU, but it's really, really good at doing parallel processing. So it's actually used for like graphics and stuff like this. So it's actually, if you have like a gaming computer, um, you probably have a discrete graphics card or something like that, that will basically do better on this. And now there's even like something called a TPU, which stands for tensor processing unit. So it turns out tensor, right? We kind of learned about this is that tensors are really useful in like machine, le machine learning itself. So it's optimized for machine learning specifically. Um, so that's kind of coming out on the market now too. But um, what's nice is that Kaggle uh, and Google Colab both offer uh, free GPU unit, basically instances. So you can upload your notebook, like a Jupyter notebook, um, upload your data even, or grab your data from there and treat it basically as if it's your normal computer, except it has a graphics uh, connected to it. So. I have this basic screen here of Google Colab, frequently asked questions and all this stuff. Um, you can go through this and everything like that. I'll share it on the Zoom chat right now since you guys are here and everything. But um, it's some good information. It was a nice little, I think this started off as a little experiment. They have been kind of tweaking it, you know, every once in a while kind of deal. Um, one thing that Colab used to have is that it used to have live like, like interaction. So you could actually like work with multiple people at the same time and you could see it live. Unfortunately, it's got the live part, which is like, was really too bad because it was a pretty awesome tool. Um, but you can kind of think of Google Colab as like, um, it's just compared to like a Google Drive note, like Google Drive, but for Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so it's kind of cool. So simply you just go, if you just look up Google Colab, I'm just going to collabresearch.google.com and you get paid, put into this page. And you can see here, I already have a couple of things in here, but you can have like some examples and stuff like this to kind of show you a little bit what, how this works. Um, there's also a welcome page here that kind of shows you a little bit what this looks like. And you also can just pull stuff from your Google Drive. So it'll actually be saved in Google Drive. And note that the, no the ending here is the IPNB. So Jupyter Notebooks. I think right now they don't support anything but Jupyter Notebooks. Um, but in the future, they're talking about maybe supporting other formats, like if you're writing an R and stuff like that. So uh, Sorry, Victor, I was writing. Do you mind okay. just showing me how you like accessed that screen again? Oh, wait, right, getting to this part right here? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. It is collab.research.google.com and I'll send it on the chat right now. But um, I'll show you guys a little bit what that looks like. If you just, if you just search, you know, on Google, let's say Google Colab with one L, by the way. Oh, <laughs> it really zoomed in. There we go. Um, but Google Colab, and you can see here, um, just a direct link and stuff like this. Okay. Cool. So yeah, kind of fun stuff. Um, but anyway, if you have a, if you have a notebook already, you can upload it, you know, so if you have like your work that you're working on, you can upload that single notebook. Um, if you have it saved in your Google Drive, you can do that. You can also pull stuff directly from GitHub, which is pretty nice. So you can basically just copy in the URL. Um, sometimes it's gonna be kind of glitchy depending on like if the person has a lot of repos or not. Um, but for the most part, um, it's pretty good. Like for example, if we went to like, um, let's, let's try one. I think it was uh, the hands-on machine learning. Um, to, if that's the right one. Yeah. So you can see he has a bunch of stuff right here. And what's cool is that um, he actually, I know um, this author had put together a little run Google Colab. So if I click on this, I'll actually open up Google Colab. But I could alternatively just copy this URL, go over to here, enter that URL. Let's see if I go ahead and just put, go search that. 
And there you go. So you can see here, it actually goes to the repo. So note that again, it goes to the repo first, and then you can select which one you want specifically. So if I want, for example, this guy right here, go ahead and click on this, and there we go. Essentially, we have a Google Colab you know, notebook. And this is basically the same structure as a Jupyter notebook. Um, there's a little table of contents on the left here. So if you basically have everything well formatted, it'll pop up here. Um, and what's cool now is like we can actually run these parts. So just like writing code and um, what's it called? Writing your text like markdown. So everything's kind of reserved here, uh, which again, super, super nice. Um, no, you can also do things like, you know, copy to drive. You can play around with it. I won't like, you know, walk through you every little aspect you can do. Uh, but you can see here, the biggest thing is going to be the, the keyboard shortcuts. If you use keyboard shortcuts, they're going to be slightly different um, because it's running in the browser. But one thing to know about this is that this does in fact work on mobile. Um, and it does work on like, you know, Chromebooks and any computer you want. So I've actually, I've actually had a few times where I've like grabbed up a phone and like coded on here just very quickly to run something, um, which is super, super convenient because like, it's like the best option I've ever had because like, I like tried years trying to program on a phone and sometimes it's just like, it's so great. And now I'm like, oh, now we have this. Um, other thing too, this is really not super important. There's a dark theme, which is just like, just nice. I just like, it's not blinding me. Anyway, there's little things. And then um, I, this is again, just for fun. I do know you can, for example, um, ask for quirky mode and power level. Um, let's have all the power and stuff like this, which is kind of what, they're just little fun things that they put in Easter, um, Easter eggs and stuff like this. They had, I think it was April Fools that they had this part. So you can use a little quirky mode. And then I think the power mode is as you type, it like gets like bigger and bigger. So again, you can play around with this stuff. Um, is it useful? Absolutely. You need corgis in your life, but I'll keep these out for now. Okay. So just know basically it's a Jupyter notebook. All right. So um, assuming you're not playing around everything like that, you kind of want to like say like, okay, how do we run stuff? So this is where it's going to get a little different from like what we had. So it's actually going to connect to a server. It's going to actually run on some computer. That's the only way for this to run. Um, it can either actually connect to your own computer, but most likely if you're using Google Colab, you want to connect it to a server, basically something that's more powerful than your computer. So the way you can connect is basically you click up here or you can click to runtime. I'll show you the, the annoying one. So you can go to runtime, you can run stuff, you can change runtime type and all that stuff. So I'll show you guys what that looks like in a second or what you can do is you can just go click run and it'll automatically connect to a runtime. Basically it'll say, okay, let me go connect. So I'll show you first like the manual way. So you click connect. And now that you want to connect to a hosted runtime. So I click on this part and it'll say connecting and it'll finally say connect once it's all done. Initializing, connected. So what's cool now, you can actually see it shows RAM and disk. Note that RAM basically is your memory, disk is like, you know, how much storage you have, right? And you can go ahead and just run this code now. So I can run this and note that because I copied this from something else is like, hey, this is Google saying, hey, this is not my code. You know, are you sure you want to run this? You know, you better know what you're doing kind of deal. And they, yeah, I know what I'm doing. So I'm going to run this. Um, so just kind of be aware, don't just copy code and just like run it, right? Um, I'm going to be careful with that. But now you can actually run this part, which I think I ran it. I couldn't tell. See, there's a little differences from like Jupyter Notebook setup, but it's the same idea. So now I'm going to go ahead and insert a code and just show you say print. Hello. And there we go. So you can see we have a little output and everything like that. So basically the same thing as Jupyter Notebooks. Okay. Um, now, one thing to do if you're doing something like what you want to use a GPU, you can actually specify a GPU. And I think, I don't think it goes by default. So if you haven't done this before, you might have to go to change runtime type. So now that I click runtime here, I scroll down to change runtime type. I click on this guy and I'll pop up a little window. And you can see here runtime type Python 3, Python 2. Uh, for the record, Python 2 is going to be outdated January. Um, they're not supporting anymore. So if anyone's saying, oh, we're running Python 2, say, eh, not for long because they're not going to be able to run it very much longer. So just know that you can change it if there was specifically Python 2 code. Um, but hardware accelerator is what we really care about. And so right now it's selected under none. And none basically just means like it's a regular CPU, like normal computer and all that stuff, but you can actually connect a GPU. So this would be a help speed up a lot of machine learning tasks. So here we can actually connect to a GPU. Um, I actually, you can connect to a TPU. However, I will say is that, um, again, t tensor processing unit, you have to do a little bit more, at least right now. Um, it doesn't happen out of the box. You have to do a little connection to make sure it'll work properly. Um, so for in general, you'll probably click GPU. Okay, so GPU and click save. And you'll see it connect now again, because now it's connecting to a server that actually does have a GPU processing unit. 
Okay, so you can see it's not connected here. And basically you can run here and this will actually use a GPU now as if you had like a graphics processing unit. Um, again, the reason why you want to use a GPU is because it has parallel processing and stuff, especially for a lot of machine learning algorithms. And especially when we go into anything like deep learning, like neural networks and stuff, um, like it's kind of ridiculous. It's kind of it's crazy how much GPUs can help you. Um, a GPU can literally take like, you know, minutes when it would have taken like a CPU taken like literally weeks. Um, so it can literally be like a huge difference. So if you're running any machine learning project, definitely run here. Um, I believe this is the one, yeah, this is the one that end-to-end -end machine learning. I believe I ran this on the GPU that was provided on here, even after I ran everything. So I just go, I'm just going all, all of it and I'll show you guys what this looks like. Oh, you're gonna freeze up on me for a second. Okay, good. <laughs> I got a little nervous there. Um, so now it's just gonna run everything. So I'm gonna follow it through. So you can see it's like running all these parts. Um, note that they might come across some issues. For example, say figure might have an issue. Oh, no, it figured it out fine. Never mind. I thought I had an issue before. Um, so note that if you're importing over the code, um, it might not have the same exact thing. Let's see if it got all the way to here. Okay, still running. So here's preparing the algorithm. Um, when I did run this, it was about an hour. Oh, someone had a question? Yeah, so, okay, so you import your code from your Jupyter notebook into mm -hmm. here, and then you run it in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And yeah. so we should be doing this because we're doing a machine learning project, right? Yeah, and this is going to help speed up a lot of the process because of the GPU. If you have your own, like, um, for example, if you have a gaming computer, uh, you probably are going to have a graphics card as well, so a GPU unit. Um, if you're having a laptop, I nearly guarantee you, you don't have a dedicated like graphics card in there. Some, there are some laptops, but those are like $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 plus uh, gaming laptops. So probably not the one that you're using right now, right? Uh, just most people don't have them. Um, but if you're curious about doing that, you can kind of play around to connect your own GPU. But in general, this is a little bit easier. Um, also one thing, I don't think I've been upgraded. But um, right now there's been, I think the past, like, I think it was like literally last week or two weeks ago that um, Google Colab said they're now updating everyone's GPU, at least in batches, to a more powerful processor, or not processor, uh, powerful GPU. So it's actually using the P100. So it should actually be even better. So you guys might actually try this out and might find out like, hey, this actually works really well. Um, where even my thing like took an hour. If you run this, this might take even shorter amount of time depending on what graphics card. Um, you have in the collab, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, so you can see here, like this is taking a while because basically it's going to be training it right here, this cross score, fourth regularization. So basically it's just spinning and everything like this. So it might take a while for this to run through. So I'll leave that on. But anyway, that's kind of like how you can connect this. Um, note, a big part of this is going to be getting the data in there. So um, if you have relatively small data, which I think in this case, if I um, since I put it in from uh, a GitHub repo, I believe this will act, this actually got the data set. So you can see the data set here is actually connected in here since it was included. If I go over back to here, let's see here, data sets. Yeah, so it's using the data sets from here. I think it's housing in this case, um, what it's using. And so it's actually getting the CSV in here. It actually automatically connects it through. However, you all probably, if you have a big enough data set size, you probably are not going to be able to put it on your GitHub to begin with. Um, like it, GitHub's going to be like, oh, that's too big. Like I can't handle this or um, all that stuff. And that's common practice. You might not show the data. You might say in your GitHub, um, like in that readme or in the, what's it called? The project itself, like the notebook, saying where you have that data, where the people can get that data and just treat it as if you're running it already downloaded. Um, that's pretty common practice too. But um, if you have a, uh, what's it called? Um, your your collab notebook here. Um, one simple way you can do it is simply just upload your data set. So you can just go ahead and upload directly for where your data set is, exists and upload in here and then run the thing. Note, however, if you do upload it, um, it's only going to be existent in that runtime. So that means when you close this down, for example, you're going to have to re-upload it again. Okay. If your data is really large, you can essentially put it in your Google Drive. This is I think this is the easiest way I've found unless you have really, really large data. Essentially, you just mount your Google Drive and you can actually use the files within your Google Drive and access it that way. That way you don't have to keep uploading it over and over and over again. You can upload it once, keep it in your Google Drive, you know, the free Google Drive doesn't matter, right? 15 gigabytes of storage, um, keep it in there and then you can mount it and access it directly. 
Um, there's a little bit of extra work you have to do with that, um, but it's not too bad. Okay. And there, you can see the sorry running through. So get some scores. And you can see here, it's grid search. I think this is the one that when I ran this, this ended up taking about an hour, actually going all the way through, I'll find this grid search. So, oh, maybe it's not that one. Maybe it's later on. One of these things, one of these things took an hour. I just remember seeing like how much time it took. But anyway, you can see a little bit, it's just working away. Um, yeah, any questions so far about how this works or um, how to use it? Sound pretty good? So if I am importing my Jupyter notebook into Google Colab, then mm -hmm. should I not have my CSV file in my Jupyter notebook folder, but put it in like a folder before the one that I'm coding so that when I do import that folder, it's not going to take try to take that CSV file as well. Are you talking more for like uploading to GitHub? Um, yeah, for like the GitHub purposes. Yeah, I think GitHub has a firm limit. Well, not, I don't know if it's firm, but it's about 100 megabytes. Um, I would probably say if it's more than like, I don't know, more than 50. I would say like 30 megabytes, you might want to just not include it in your GitHub because then you have to include that every single time. Yeah. Um, so what you can do is just keep it where it is, like where, however you treat it, but don't do a git add. When you do a git add, make sure you specifically add those parts. Okay. Or what you can do, you can do your .git ignore file and add the file name or the, the data file name in the git ignore and it'll always ignore that and it'll try to add it at any time. Oh. Uh, yeah, so cool. Any other questions? Um, whether GitHub or, or not GitHub, but uh, Colab or, you know, working with GitHub and Colab? Uh, Victor, do you suggest to do the uh, machine learning project, like the module five project to do on this platform, Google Colab? Yeah, I would say Google Colab, or I'll show you in a second, uh, Kaggle kernels. Um, uh, I think I've done projects in this way, actually. I've no I think everyone I've done who's on their capstone has done their capstone when they're doing machine learning, like training and stuff like that. They just done it in Colab. Um, so they don't do it in Jupyter and then import it to Colab. They just do it oh, directly in Colab. Sorry. Yeah. They usually will actually write their code in Jupyter notebook, do their Git ads and stuff like this, and then just run it, like actually run it in Colab. So they're doing all the work on Jupyter because they're more familiar with it and then do this. But there's no problem. If you wanted to do everything in Colab, you can. But then just know that then you have a complexity of like, oh, you have to add it to GitHub and make those changes and stuff like that. So um, also, if you were to make changes, let's say you do have most of your work on Jupyter Notebook and you make changes, you can just go ahead and do file download or I said download.ipnb. And that will just save whatever you have, including like, you know, the most recent um, like runs and stuff like that. And it'll save that onto a .ipnb and then you can, you know, save that however you want. Cool. Um, does that answer your guys' questions? Yeah, I mean, my, so instead of giving the GitHub link, we're gonna give the like Kaggle uh, link for the, for the, for the, for that project. Um, um, you would still want to do your GitHub thing. So what you could do, let's say, for example, you want to run it, right, in Colab, but then you still want it on your GitHub, which I think that's what you should do, right, is have your final project in your GitHub. You can run it, and then once these, like, let's say you wanted to keep all these outputs, you can then go download the .ipnb file and then upload it to your GitHub. Okay. Does that make all sense? All right, got it. Thanks. Okay. No problem. And actually, I'm looking at this now. I think oh, I might have been. Does, is, does Kaggle have the same thing? Like you can download the whole notebook to as a IPNP? Yeah. So I'll show that next too. Um, All, right. All right. So yeah, you can definitely do that. Down, just download whatever work you have into a IPNP. All right. Okay. I think even, I could be wrong. I haven't done this directly. Um, I don't think Colab has it, but I'm trying to think if kernel, if Kaggle's kernel is if you can directly connect it with GitHub, but maybe not, maybe it's just on their side. But anyway, um, note that if you do any changes on here, you can save them on Colab and then also in Kaggle kernels, you can save it 
um, and then you know look at it later. But note that if you want to run it again, you might have to restart the runtime, just like restarting your computer. If you turn off your computer, turn it back on, your work will still be there, but you're gonna have to run each you know cell by itself. So when we're doing this um, and we're like coding in Jupyter Notebook, so do you suggest not running like the machine learning part of the code in Jupyter Notebook, but then like at that point bring it into here? And yeah. that's when we should start running. Yeah, the main it in thing here. is. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry. So that includes like the grid search stuff and all of that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I would say like you can do most of like the exploration, but the machine learning aspect, what you might find if you try running on your uh, computer, you might find you have to like only do a couple of them or um, reduce the number of like, you know, um, like you might not even be able to fit all the data on your computer. So it makes a lot of sense to just go ahead and run it on something like a cloud service like Colab. Okay. And then like, since we're still kind of deciding which like machine learning algorithm we want to use, mm -hmm. we would just then do all of that on the Google Colab or the Kaggle one, if mm -hmm. whatever we pick, right? Yeah, I think that's Directly? good. You okay. Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it. Um, one thing I'll say too, like for example, you can see here, they went directly into a randomized search and a grid search. Um, you, one thing I would suggest is run at least one model without a grid search, you know, like no change of parameters, just to kind of gauge about how long it'll take. And then that will give you a better idea of like how much time this, this whole thing will take to train. Which I will say that I am actually really surprised right now because I ran this like maybe a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago. Um, and it took an hour and it definitely um, <laughs> was faster. So I wonder if now the upgraded, I, I could check the GPU probably and see um, what the, what GPU they're using. Actually, do, would you guys like to see how to check what the GPU looks like? Okay, yeah, okay. Might, might as well. All right, so let's see. Uh, so I don't remember it off the top of my head because I am not a genius. Um, so I say check GPU. Um, Collab. Let's see what comes up. All right, check allocated. Let's say check what kind of GPU. Check allocated GPU. That's not what I want. I know it's a train thing using GPU. Let's just try the very first one. Maybe there's a. Maybe I'm judging it too quickly. Wow, is my internet just slow today? Oh, okay. Maybe we're not meant to find out about the inner workings of Colab. I don't know. Okay, cool. So yeah, the old ones were K80s. I heard that you can now get a 1080. I want to check. Uh, uh, no. Sorry, I kind of, I already kind of already know what the command is. I just can't remember off the top of my head. I like how to check it. Mm. Nope, I'm not seeing it here. So, oh, hey, there we go. Uh, that's not the command I'm looking for, but this will work. So this is connecting to something called TensorFlow, which is like a machine learning framework. Um, you use a lot for deep learning stuff like this. And this is going to tell us like what the devices are. You can see the GPU. So yeah, you see the default is K80, which is the, when was this written? Written 2018. So yeah, this definitely will be using the old one. So let's try it out. I'm excited. I haven't seen if I had a P80 or So I'm wondering now, like, why did it run an hour if it's not <laughs> updated? But this is basically importing the library. It's connecting the GPU. So it takes some time. Oh, wait, is this still running? No, it's still not running. Sorry, I'm kind of talking to myself as I'm kind of going through. Let's see if this is, oh, it's still running. Let me go ahead and stop it. Interrupt execution. All right. Now that it stopped it from running. Yeah, yeah, I know. Just still go through. Okay, let's try to run that again. Oh, I do have a Ken. Sorry, it looks like I have a K80. Okay, I don't know, maybe. Maybe it's another thing I, I was running and I got mistaken or something. But, oh, if you do have the upgrade one, this should show, um, I think it was a P100. Um, so instead of K, K80. Anyway, all right, that's too bad. I was like, uh, that's disappointing. Oh, well. <laughs> all right, so anyway, this is Google Colab um, going through all that stuff. Um, oh, also you can share it too. So if you did want to share it specifically, like, have someone 
uh, edit it and stuff like this, you can share it directly. A note that in this case, I have to actually make a copy. So let's see if I just do this real quick, just to show you guys. If you wanted to, sh let's say for example, uh, you're asking for a one-on-one -on -one and you want to see like, hey, well, how do I, um, how to make this work and everything like this, you can go and click share. And then just like, you know, like a Google Drive, you can just go ahead, uh, get advanced and like actually share someone to just view it or you can share it so they can actually edit it. Okay, cool. All right, um, yeah. So any questions before I move on to Kaggle kernels? I have one real quick yeah. just over this code in general, I guess. <clears throat> so when it's like a, the grid search or the randomized grid search, mm -hmm. should we set the number of jobs to negative one? Let's see here. You're talking about for one of the parameters for yeah, jobs? Yeah, right, because wouldn't that set everything in parallel or try to use the most processors you can, or you can play around with not it. make it faster necessarily. I actually don't recall what the default for grid search is. My guess is that grid search is already using the optimum. I don't know if you looked at the documentation Andy already. Um, and yeah, because it says for, for grid search, it has an underscore jobs is equal to none. And so that means it's running one and, but if you say it's a negative one, <clears throat> then it uses all the processors. So I was just, cause I know in some of the, <clears throat> some of the answers to some of the labs they were using mm -hmm. an underscore job is equal to negative one. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if that was just like a normal thing to, to try to run as many in parallel as you could, or yeah, I, if that would, I would really say, speed it up or not. Well, it, it definitely speed it up in parallel. Cause what I think would happen is that it'll run each like, cause grid search will basically run through one example and then spit that out um, and then go through like another set of parameters and spit that out. I think in parallel in this case, it's saying, um, sorry, I'm just kind of reading this. I mean, it's one less. Okay. Um, is that it should run multiple instances at the mm -hmm. same time. So it could potentially speed it up. Um, yeah, you could try it out and see you know, see what happens a little bit. Um, just kind of warning, I would be aware, um, we haven't talked about like big, big data and stuff like this in um, computer architecture, but you can come across something called thrashing, where essentially you try doing too many things in parallel with too many jobs. So let's say you specify, say, oh, I'm gonna try 15 jobs, but only eight threads are available. It might actually have a tr trouble trying to do 15 jobs and it'll actually get stuck even though it's like, It'll like basically be like equivalent like the RAM is super ramped up, but like nothing's happening. Um, so I would just proceed with caution on your own local computer. But yeah, Google Colab, yeah, just go ahead and just like run it with minus one, see what happens. It runs faster. Cool. Yeah, that's a nice thing. Like again, it's a nice place, like like a little playground. Like you can just do whatever you want. Cool. Awesome. Um, and speaking of like runtime and stuff like this, you can do the ma runtime managed runtimes or managed sessions. And if you have multiple sessions, so for example, I'm gonna connect this one real quick. Just to kind of show you guys what this looks like. It's connecting. Oh, this is dot by, whatever. I won't care. Let's see if I close this. I think this will be, oops, sorry. Doing the wrong thing. Runtime and sessions. And you should see, oh, I guess there's not two of them. Oh, that's because there's only GPU. If I do none, this will show up too. So you can see here, you can actually terminate these sessions. So if you know one that's running really like a lot, you can actually terminate this because you do have a limited amount of um, you can do. So it's free, but they're gonna limit you and saying if you're trying to run like 50, you know, like GPU instances, notebooks running all at the same time, um, it's not gonna let you do that. So you can see here how much RAM it's using, how much GPU you used. Okay. Cool. All right, so sound good? I think I exhausted most of the things that you probably would care about with Colab. And again, play around with it, you know, check it out and everything. But I think I showed you everything that you really need to like make sure it works. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on to Kaggle. So Kaggle has, um, we talked about finding the data sets. So you can definitely find data sets in here. You know, you can search through them and everything like that. Uh, for example, ooh, forest fires in Brazil. That's an interesting data set. And then I pull this up and say, ooh, interesting. You can check out a little bit like what the columns are and everything like that. So what's nice is that if you do find a data set on Kaggle, you can directly make your Jupyter notebook, your, your notebook essentially on Kaggle directly with their kernels. So what you can do is say, okay, I find this data set. And you're like, all right, this looks pretty cool. I'm gonna make a new notebook. Now I click my new notebook. And what's really nice, you can go ahead and say, okay, what language you're gonna use. Um, in this case, we're gonna use a notebook or a script. 
script would be closer to .py versus .ipmb. So we want a notebook in this case. Um, I don't know, advanced settings, this is kind of new. Ooh, I haven't played around this for a long time. Um, <laughs> so you can see there's GPU right here, which is probably what we want um, for more like the machine learning part. So you can see here, do that many analysis but available is limited. So you might have full access to it. Um, we're going to ignore this part. This is basically a uh, Google Cloud services. Note that Kaggle is owned by Google. So that's kind of like why this kind of like tends to be a little more Google centric. Um, but you can connect your Google account, I guess, to Google Cloud service. I haven't seen this before. So anyway, but for the most part, you can basically just click this part right here. I'd maybe select GPU if you're going to do machine learning. So then create, create my notebook. It's going to start going through. And you can see this kind of connection going through here draft session, and eventually this will show connected. And what's cool is that this data will already be preloaded. You don't have to worry about uploading it anywhere. It will already be set on this computer now. And so you can actually check out the data here. So um, if I run this right here, this is what's the default that's for any new notebook. You can go and take this guy, and you can actually read through, for example, if I do, let's see, um, you can see where this exists in working. I believe I can just go ahead and go into, Sorry, I'm just kind of exploring a little bit. You can see I'm kind of running little uh, parts in here. So I believe I actually can go right here if I was name. Anyway, you can get uh, the exact, um, basically this imports it already for you. So you're ready to basically use the data set already. Okay. So I think I can just do a file name since it's already saved into this part so you can see amazon.csv. So I didn't have to do anything. I can say, okay, I can say, you know, like let's say um, pandas already imported, so do pd.readcsv. And let's just do file names zero, which is just me, Amazon. No, maybe not. Oh, I hate this. Um, hmm, I'm trying to think real quick. Buffer file not found. Oh, I have to connect it with. Sorry, everyone. I want to connect it here. So that's the full path. You guys see that? So this is the file name, but I'm not in that path. I want to go to Kaggle input forest fires or forest fires in Brazil, Amazon.csv. So I should just copy. Well, if I just went ahead and copied uh, this. Then we almost got it. Oh, because it's a different UTF. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, in theory, you'd be able to connect to this guy here. But the idea here, um, you have the data set already loaded in here. So you don't have to upload it yourself. So it's a very large data set. You don't have to, what's it called? Um, like you don't have to upload it and then do something with it. So that's a nice thing if you already have it on Kaggle. Okay. And then would uh, you do all of your coding like in this toggle? Yeah, okay, if you do all your coding in here. You can, for example, you can upload a notebook. So you can see if you have this connected right here, I can upload a notebook. And let's just go to developer. Uh, let's go see one that we have already. Um, this is not going to be related at all. So it doesn't really matter. but. I'm just uploading a notebook. And then you should still be able to have access to this one. So you could actually have it already put in here and then access um, the data set in here. So it makes it kind of easy where you don't have to, um, if you did have your own notebook, you can do that. Or you can directly work on Kaggle's kernel. Um, I personally have just been used to using a lot of Google Colab. Like I have my own notebook. I kind of know how it works. So I just upload it through here. Um, but I know a lot of people who will just go through Kaggle and like, uh, run all their stuff in here. We even like save it on here directly. So, yeah. Does that make sense? So, would you say in the real world, like, are people using Jupyter Notebook or not mm -hmm. so much? Yeah, I would say it. So, I would kind of break this up in two parts. One is basically like more of the exploration phase of just being like the initial stages of being like, okay, we have this problem, you know, let's explore it kind of deal. You might have a little sample data set. And my sample data set might be, you know, a gigabyte large or something like that. So it's like, oh, let me test this out, see, explore it, um, maybe do a little machine learning on it and stuff like that. And you might be using something like Colab, or if you're an industry, what you might be using is something that would be kind of like Colab, more, or um, what's it called? Like you might be using like your own server, essentially. 
either that's on site or off site. So it could be like AWS, Google Cloud Platform, or something connected to. Basically, you, some places actually have their own data science um, machine learning computer like on site that you can connect to and run on there. So it's a, as if it's like a normal desktop computer or like your laptop computer. Um, I see a lot of people do this as like an initial step. They're just playing around with it just to see it work. Um, I personally, like when I kind of like do like um, things that are like if I want to do like a little exploration stuff like that, I might run it in Google Colab. But since I have my own desktop that does have a graphics card, I'll just run it on my desktop. But if I want something even more powerful than that, I might actually go connect to like a server where like, okay, like I actually want to like I'll spin up like a Google Cloud Platform instance or even AWS instance, right? That's more common now. Um, but uh, run it in AWS if I want to put out in production, stuff like this. But for playing around with it, you just kind of use whatever tools are available to just to kind of like allow yourself to see things. And the big thing is going to be if you're using a laptop, your laptop's just not going to be powerful enough to run a machine learning model. So yeah. Does that kind of give an idea of like how these tools kind of connect together? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm just like so used to Jupyter and Notebook that now it's like, oh, this looks so different. <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> it definitely is a different kind of looking tool and stuff like that. Um, and this is where like, you know, if you're used to using Jupyter Notebook, that's perfectly fine. Um, you can just upload your notebook and just like run it, you know, like have it all set up and like you run all of it except for maybe like the machine learning model part and then upload it and then just run it so you can see the machine learning aspect of it. And then you can even download it right after words and see how well it does, um, stuff like this. But note that if you upload or download, it's not gonna remember what things you ran. So you can't do necessarily analysis directly on like just downloading it over without saving the model itself, which we haven't talked about. Um, but I think the best thing to do is kind of like plan out your code a little bit and then, you know, run it on, you know, let's say something like Colab and then it's like, okay, cool, it looks good. You know, maybe you code a little bit on here and then download it um, and then finish up your coding on Jupyter Notebook, upload it or copy and paste. People have their own kind of like ways they want to approach this. Um, but the big thing I would say is making sure it works is however you do it, make sure you upload or whatever you do um, so it's consistent on one thing and run it all the way through to make sure that it's going to work properly and then make sure you save that as your final thing because sometimes you can get into this part where like you've been working partly on collab partly on Jupyter notebook you know going back and forth back and forth and then you fr you lose some stuff in between and then you try to run it one time or you upload it and then you find out it doesn't work you like, oh my gosh why doesn't it work um this is where versioning can be really helpful so Wait, sorry, why would you lose stuff in between? Yeah, so if you imagine, like, I have, like, my Jupyter Notebook, I have it all set up, I upload it to Google Colab, like, right here. And then I say, oh, okay, this looks really good. It's like, oh, wait, I made a mistake, I need to change this to results, or something like that, right? And then say, I run this through, I run it through, it looks good, and then I forget to download it. Or I download it and don't overwrite my old stuff. And then I come back to it, you know, make some changes on Jupyter Notebook, upload it again and run it through and it's not working anymore. And I'm like, why isn't it working? I just, it was working perfectly fine before. And it's because I forgot to, I didn't, I changed this, made this little change on Colab, then download onto my Jupyter, onto my local uh, computer. Okay, so just make yeah. sure you're like downloading in between. Yeah, make sure you have a good system that's keeping track of between those two parts. So my, my suggestion is every time you upload it to Google Colab, run it, download it, and then do a, basically treat that as your new, like your new uh, notebook versus like keeping your old notebook and stuff like this. Um, it just, it's technically going to be a little more work, but I think it's going to keep it more consistent in this way. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. And it do frequent commits on GitHub for sure. Like if you view it on GitHub like this, like, you know, you put all your stuff in here instead of uploading Google Colab, like the notebook to Google Colab, you can simply just go ahead and make a new one from, um, what's it called? Um, I just realized this, but you can upload a notebook from GitHub directly. And that way you know for sure it's the most recent one since you just uploaded it up there. Okay. Cool. I just realized too, there's a little save a copy in GitHub. Hmm. I never tried this, so maybe try this out and everything. So. This is new to me. <laughs> so, 
right? Um, yeah. Hopefully that kind of gives you guys a good idea for like how to run the machine learning model, especially because like if you do a grid search, you might find yourself like, wow, it's been like three hours. Like, is this ever going to end? Um, this is why, first of all, if you do run a machine learning model, run a small one first just to make sure your code is working fine. And then you can do something more detailed like a grid search. All right, any questions and um, anything at all? Victor, I have a question about the data sets. Mm -hmm. um, like um, <clears throat> for, I mean, I, I'm also working on a uh, module five project and looking for mm -hmm. a good data set. Um, the, I watched watch your um, other video about the, how mm -hmm. to pick the right data set. So, um, uh, but um, I found one good one on Kaggle, but that's just very large. So do you mm -hmm. think it's a good idea to um, resample that kind of big data to work on just only partially? Like, Yeah, definitely. I, I think in, for this project, you know, for Modify project, uh, we haven't talked about how to deal with like large data sets. Um, I think resampling it, like downsampling it um, would be perfectly fine. Um, the biggest thing is going to be making sure you have a good distribution of classes. So if you have like 10 different classes, you don't resample where it's only like class two and one. Um, so just being careful of that. But yeah, I think resampling would be the right choice. And I'd say if you get around 50,000 to 100,000, like assuming you have a very large data set, between 50,000 and 100,000 data points, I think that'd be more than sufficient for this project. Okay. Do you know if there's like, um, I mean, there are techniques to make sure you have, you know, totally random and right portion mm -hmm. of some resampling. Mm -hmm. What would be the technique that I would, I need to use? Well, it depends on your data set, right? Like if your data set's already well balanced, you can probably just randomly sample across it. Um, if you randomly sample across any data set, um, you usually will end up finding your like because of the central limit theorem basically you'll have the similar distribution of like the original data set right um assuming like with sand with um what's it called um with replacement so if you'd like to do a bootstrap sample um and that's pretty typical um if you don't have a well like i mean it depends how you want to view like when you're resampling do you want to resample it just to be like oh i resample and now this is my data set or you want to say oh this is my data set but it's so large, we're going to play around with a smaller data set. Um, it kind of depends how you kind of view it. Um, if you're looking at just saying, oh, here's my data set, um, you might say, oh, well, let me just resample it, but let me make sure there is enough classes for each one of those so balance. So there's techniques like SMOTE, S M O T E. You can probably Google that and see, like, you know, ways oh, to yeah, do it. Yeah, I, I saw that mm -hmm. in the curriculum in the past. Yeah. Yeah, so that might be one technique if you don't have, if you have a class balance, uh, a class imbalance problem, so. Okay. 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 Cool. Thanks. No problem. All right. Sound pretty good, everyone? All right, exciting. Yeah, and we'll have office hours the rest of this week, too. So as you guys kind of go dig deeper and deeper into it, too, um, feel free to, you know, ask more questions and everything. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys are feeling pretty excited about kind of doing this a little bit. I guess uh, we'll end it here then. Um, I guess I could stop recording too.